Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 8, and we'll be examining verses 40 to 56 this morning. As we study the gospel of Luke, one of the things that Luke is doing, and, and, I, and hopefully, prayerfully, you're, you're seeing this as we study the gospel, one of the things that Luke is addressing are those people who Jesus comes into contact, contact with that are those that are doubters. And he's, as, and he's doing this as he tells the story of Jesus, and as Jesus shares, or as Luke shares key points in Jesus' life, in Jesus' ministry, and as he explains these things, what he's doing, he's trying to tell them of who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what the Lord Jesus told them. doubters of the Bible, doubters of Christ Jesus. And, and Luke is addressing this in his text this morning, not only to the people that he's writing to, the first hearers, the first readers, but our people as well. And this morning, I want to draw your attention to both of these miracles at the same time in our passage and to see how Luke does this. First, Jairus, the synagogue ruler, the synagogue ruler comes to Jesus, and he's clearly a loving, a loving father. He has one daughter, about 12 years old, the scripture says, and she's dying. And he is the first of two people who find themselves, notice this, he finds himself at the feet of Jesus, imploring him to help him. Now, we're not told if Jesus said anything to the man but Jesus immediately begins to make his way toward the house of Jairus. And that's when the second event really just interrupts the first event. The second event is the woman with the blood condition. Now let's, re let's review the story here. Jesus is on his way to the house, and in verse 42 it says that the crowds were pressing against him. And then in verse 43, a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and I find it amazing, and I always have every time I read this section of, of Luke's gospel, how this lady has had this hemorrhaging, this, this blood condition, as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive, that she had suffered. And she couldn't be healed by this condition. And if you look at Mark chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, Mark tells us that this woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and it had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. The woman's condition, see, we don't think of it today, but, the, but people back in those days, and this woman... In particular, this woman's condition had physical effects. One of the effects was continual bleeding. Another one was fatigue. Another one was lack of strength. And we could probably add in there probably constant pain. But here's the other thing besides that physical, it had social effects. Now, according to Leviticus chapter 15, verses 19 to 27, a woman with a bleeding condition, that meant that she could not go to the temple. She could not attend the synagogue. And for people that their whole lives, their, their, their personal lives, their social lives, lives, everything surrounded about with the synagogue and being able to attend the synagogue or go to the temple, this woman could her, they too would become ceremonially unclean. So the woman was an outcast both in, her, in society and in her family. 
And this woman, it tells us, she proceeds to follow Jesus into that crowd, and she reaches out her hand to touch him. She doesn't just touch him. Notice this. She just, what, touches the fringes of his garment. And it says that she touches him, and immediately Jesus stops and says, who is the one who touched me? Now, Peter in verse 45, and when I, when I read that, knowing Peter and studying Peter, the life of Peter, I thought, who else would say it? Just who else? Peter looks at her, and according to Scripture, he says, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. If it was today, Peter would say, Ah, uh, Lord. No disrespect, but look around. There's a lot of people here. And there, all these people are crowding in on you. Lord, no disrespect, but what do you mean who touched me? And beloved, when the Lord asks that question, he isn't asking it so he'll know. For his benefit. He's asking the question for her benefit. And we see that in the follow-up on it. Because in verse 46, he says, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that the power had gone out of me. And when this woman who had fought this disease for 12 years, when she saw that she had not escaped notice, it says that she came. And what does she do? She comes trembling. Now remember, see, we don't see the whole picture today because of our lifestyle. Back then, she was an outcast. She should not even been near the crowd, let alone touch Jesus, who we know was a rabbi, right? He was a teacher. And she came trembling and fell before him. Here's the second person to find herself at the feet of Jesus. And might I say this to all of us this morning, that's not a bad place to be. At the feet of the Savior. Both of these people that bow at Jesus' feet, they do what? They believe that Jesus is able to cure their ails. In the case of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, he believes that Jesus is able to heal the, his daughter. In the case of the second person, the woman, she believes that Jesus is able to, to heal herself. And here's the great thing. She has given testimony to the of Jesus hearing Luke's letter, whether it was being read to you or you had the opportunity to read it, in your Jewish mindset, the first thing, one of the first things that would have gone to your mind was the Hebrew scriptures back in, in Numbers chapter 5 and verses 1 through 4. Numbers 5, 1 through 4 says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they sent away from the camp the leper. Okay? And everyone have a discharge. So if you're a leper, if you have a discharge. And number three, everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. You shall send away both male and female. You shall send them outside the camp so that they will not defile the camp where I dwell in their midst, the Lord says. And then we continue on. The sons of Israel did so and sent them outside the camp, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses, thus the sons of Israel did. Again, notice the three categories of people who are to be sent outside the camp, ostracized, outcast, a leper, those who 
those with uh, discharge, those who have come into contact with a dead person. Now, why are they supposed to be sent outside the camp? Because they're defiled. They're unclean. And they are ceremonially unclean. And they cannot even be in the camp. That was designed to show the children of Israel a number of things. The first thing it was shown to show the children of Israel was that sin defiles. Amen? Does it still do that today? Amen, it does. It shows to us, listen to this. You ready for the second thing it shows? It shows that sin separates. Does sin separate today? Yeah. It not only separates the sinner from God, but they couldn't worship. They couldn't come to the temple. They couldn't come to the tabernacle. And if you were unclean, you couldn't worship with the people of God when they gathered to worship. It showed the separation that exists among, amongst believers. Those who were defiled were even cut off from their people for a time period. And if you read elsewhere in the book of Numbers and, and in the book of Leviticus, very often the period of defilement was about seven days. And then you had to go through a ritual before you could be restored to the camp. And if you had an encounter with any of those three groups, you were unclean too. And that meant that you had to go through the ritual as well. Now put yourself as a first century hearer or maybe reader of Luke. And you read about this woman, and you understand numbers. You understand what the old, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, I almost called it the Old Testament. I'm trying to get away from that. What the Hebrew scriptures writes. And you see this woman who is unclean reaching her hand out to touch Jesus. I think the second thing that, that would have gone through your mind, not only would Numbers chapter 5 gone through your mind, but number two thing that would have gone through your mind was don't touch him. Don't touch him because if you touch him, he's going to be unclean too. But Luke tells us that when she touched him, she had been immediately healed and was made what? Clean. Made whole. You see what Luke is saying to the skeptics of his day and really even the skeptics of today? Jesus didn't become unclean. She became clean. You and I today as sinners, we were unclean. But when we encountered Jesus Christ, he didn't Praise God for that. Amen. That is why Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Notice our Lord is not saying that somehow faith magically did something for her. Did you notice that? Or our, our Lord is saying that faith in him was the instrument. It was the means of the blessing of his healing grace. And just like this woman who was unclean because of the hemorrhage, just like you and I who are unclean because of sin, he is the one who made her well. He is the one who makes us spiritually well. And God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and God's power is what made her well. But it was her faith by which she grasped it. And it's the same way for salvation, whether it was in Luke's time or our time. It's God who does it through Jesus Christ and him alone. Faith in and of itself does not save you. You came into this sanctuary this morning 
you sit down in those pews and I will almost guarantee it, not a one of you thought, oh my goodness, I wonder if this pew is going to hold me up. Amen? Yeah, you just came in and sat down. Why? Because you, you've sat there before. One, but two, you had faith in the object. The object was the pew. The object, the, the instrument of our salvation is putting our faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. And it's God's grace that saves us. It's, it's Jesus' life and death and his resurrection and even his ascension that saves us. But we must believe on him. We must believe on him to receive the benefit of his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. We must believe on his saving work. And Luke wants us to understand that. Luke wants us, even the most hardened skeptic, whether it's of his times of our time, is to understand that when you come into contact with Jesus, he's not made unclean, you are made clean. And he has the power to heal you spiritually. And when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are healed spiritually just like this lady immediately. And nothing and no one else can do it. Well, that's the second event. But let's go back to the first event. By this time, the servant of the house comes to Jairus and he says, your daughter is dead. She has died. Then he tacks this on, do not trouble the teacher anymore. Now, let's remember, beloved, at first, Jairus and the household, they, had, they were full of confidence that Jesus could heal the sick girl. But when she dies, there's no confidence that he can do anything about it. And I love this about our Savior. He doesn't waver, does he? Notice what he says. He says, don't be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. And the Lord makes his, house, his way to the house, and the mourners, they're already there. And my studying of, uh, of, of the Greek text what they would do in, in a Jewish home is, is when a loved one passed away, they would hire in professional mourners. And they would come in and for a price tag, and the more you paid, the more crying, the more boo-hooing, and the more all the other stuff went on. And I remember my old Bi Bible college teacher, he said in this text, he talked about it, because Jairus was what? synagogue official he had some money mrs gyrus whatever her name was probably hired the best so there's all kinds of commotion going on they're weeping in the house and but really rightfully so it's a sad event this little 12 12 year old girl has died she's gone And here comes Jesus. And what does he say to the crowd? What does he say to mom and dad? Stop weeping. Stop weeping. She's not dead. But what? She's asleep. And what do the professionals do? They start laughing at him. But back up in verse 51... We're told when he came into the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, James, or Peter, John, and James, and the girl's mom and dad. And just like with the woman with the blood issue, I'm sure that every Jewish listener to Luke's account here was thinking, oh my goodness, Jesus, don't touch her. Why? They're going back to Numbers chapter 5. He, however, in verse 54, took her by the hand, called 
saying, Child, arise. Remember me saying that when Jesus, when the woman touched Jesus, he didn't become unclean? She became clean? In this case, event number two, Jesus isn't unclean either. But the young girl's alive. It kind of, well, more than kind of, it's the same way when you and I are dead in our sins. And we have that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're dead in our sins, we don't make Jesus unclean or make him dead. Beloved, we become alive. We become alive. And once again, Luke is telling us who this teacher is. This is Jesus. This is Messiah. This is the anointed one. He doesn't become unclean when he touches the dead body. He doesn't become unclean when he touches the contact with the woman with the bloody discharge. No, they become clean. They become alive. And the same thing is true for you and I. Now, if there's any skeptics listening this morning, I hope you see what Luke is doing here. Luke is telling you who Jesus is. And Luke is saying to skeptics, back then and even today, believe him. Believe Jesus. You can trust him. You can stake your life on him. And he will not and cannot fail you. Luke is showing the skeptic where life comes from, and it comes from the God-man. It comes from Jesus Christ. And Luke is showing the skeptic, the events, who he is and what he can do because he knows that in the end, and it's true back then in Luke's day and it's true today, the dividing line of all reality is whether you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or you don't. That's the bottom line. And notice the two people who leave those two events leave with their hearts filled with testimony to the glory of God. The two and Luke wants the skeptic today to see that you too can believe in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone be saved. Amen? Amen? Well, let's pray. Our Lord God, this morning, those of us who know you as our Lord and Savior, Father, we fall at your feet. We fall before you, prostrate ourselves before you, thanking you for our salvation. We were so unworthy, but yet you called us, you drew us. And we were made clean. We were made alive. But Father, if someone is listening this morning, they haven't believed in you for their salvation. Father, I pray. that their need for salvation is through you and you alone. And they too, like the two people in the two accounts, will fall at your feet and cry. Father, we pray that you have your will and your way and that you will lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.